Hi, uh, I'm Brad Swain. I've been at LifeRay for 11 years now. Um, I'm an Amazon certified SysOps administrator, and I've put uh, LifeRay in the cloud, Rackspace, HP Helion, and Amazon for probably three plus years I've been doing that. So that's why I'm able to talk to you about this today. Um, show of hands, is anybody already in the cloud with LifeRay? Couple? Anybody planning to move to the cloud? Okay, great, awesome. So a uh, real quick overview of what infrastructure as a service is. As I talk about these things, I want to say platform as a service or infrastructure as a service. Um, Amazon is infrastructure as a service. It is basically the ability to spin up machines on the fly as, as you will, which is really nice. Um, how does it help your developers? It helps developers because you can have exact copies of production to work against all the time. You can just take a snapshot of a production database, file system, machine, and move it over, create another copy of it, and work on it, which is really great for debugging and things like that, making sure you can do production load tests without actually taking production down with a load test, right? Which is awesome. Um, it helps sysadmins as well for the same, same reasons, really. You can scale at ease. So, you know, if you're having a big push and you need more servers right away, you can spin those up. And also, um, we have a problem in the past with licensing for that. But with DXP, you can now have uh, LifeRay connected services going and you can do hourly charges. So you can spin LifeRay up on a per hour basis and then drop them down, which is really, really convenient. Um, and you don't have to know DevOps. You don't have to even know what DevOps is. Does it help you to know what that is? Yeah, it does help. You can do a lot of cool things with it, but you don't have to know it. Um, it's nice that you don't have to know all the underpinnings. You don't have to be like, oh, I'm running Intel versus AMT or AMD or whatever you're doing. Um, Amazon kind of handles it all for you, and it works very well. And one other complaint that I get is, well, I don't want to move everything to the cloud, right? I don't want all my life stuff to be in the cloud. I need some stuff to be on-prem and then some stuff to be in the cloud. And that's okay. You can do that. You can do Amazon Direct Connect or you can do VPN tunnels. There's lots of different ways that you can do a hybrid architecture of some stuff on site, some stuff in this data center and backup stuff in the cloud, for example. Um, and the best part about everything being in the cloud is it's really simple to reboot servers and do everything. That's my son, he's one years old and he's ready to go. The server crashes, you can just reboot that instance on Amazon and keep going which is great. So, when does moving to the cloud make sense? It makes sense to move to the cloud if you don't want to or can't handle your own network stack. You know, if you're just a couple developers and you guys don't have time to develop all these business applications and manage all your IT stuff and buy servers and worry about, you know, being ddos and all these other things. Um, if business moves faster than IT can. So if all of a sudden you've got this business group that really wants to do all these cool things and you have to start spinning up more clusters and more machines and you guys don't have the budget or the time to go and provision all these new machines, it's a good, good time to move to the cloud you can do it very quickly. Um, if you don't know what your hardware is going to look like in six months, you know, there's a possibility of you're building this app and you say, well, it's going to be small at first and then it explodes and it goes really well, and you, know, you only bought so many servers, and now you need way more. Or worse, you bought too many servers, you spent a bunch of money, and it turns out you don't need all those servers. So the cloud's very nice because you have those hourly charges, and it's nothing. And hourly charges aren't much. It's like a buck or less for really good servers. Um, scaling, so as I said before, I work for... Um, I work for LifeRay, but I'm consulting for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I've been doing that for three years, and we do a lot of things where we have to scale up and down due to load, especially during like Christmas season. You know, we really pump the servers up, we add more servers to the cluster, run them for a couple weeks, and then at the end of those couple weeks, we'll take those servers down. Being able to do that virtually with, that, with just scripting commands to physically add servers is amazing, right? It's really cool. And that's on HP Helion that we're running that. And also, if you, if you just can't have downtime, um, HP is a big deal for that because they run $7 million an hour through their website. So every time there's an outage, you know, you've got the business guys knocking on your door going, hey, 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 that's half hour. That's $3.5 million you just cost me. Where's, where are my servers? I need them back up. Right? So you can do region replication and you can um, use uh, DNS hosts to make sure that you're pretty much always up. Like all of Amazon would pretty much have to go down for you to be down and Amazon is not going to go down. It's just not going to happen. Maybe one availability zone, but not a whole region. So what does it look like? What does architecture look like inside Amazon? So as you can see here, we've got um, an SSH jump box, or they also call them a bastion server, and then your VPC and elastic load balancing 
we've got, in this case, it's a two-node life ray cluster, okay? And this is an actual production architecture I've used before. It wasn't two nodes, it was four nodes, but there's no point. So uh, we use uh, J groups with S3 ping to do discovery. So one of the things about life ray, or um, specifically the tools it uses, J groups, uh, uses multicast by default to do cluster detection to find all the nodes. Unfortunately, Amazon doesn't support layer two networking, which means no multicast. You just can't do it. So you can actually change J groups to use a TCP connection. And what happens is when a LifeRay node comes up, it puts a little file inside an S3 bucket. S3 is a file storage for Amazon. And it used as that bucket for discovery. So the node comes up, looks at everybody else, and says, hey, look, all these different nodes in the cluster. And it registers itself, and then everybody else notices, and they all link together. Node goes down. It either times out, if it's, a if it's like a hard drop, and it'll get killed, or it safely takes itself out of the cluster, and then everybody just gets updated. Very nice. Works great. You can also use JDBC ping, which bases it against the database, but I prefer using S3 ping. I think it's great, because you can just load up the S3 bucket view, and you can look at the files, and it tells you exactly what's in your cluster right now. So there's no guessing of, well, you know, my cluster is split. Is this one in the cluster? Is that one in the cluster? You can just go look at the files. Yep, they're there. It works. It's perfect. It's easy. Um, RDS is for databases. S3 is your file storage. And Elasticsearch is for all the other things. And going back to Nathan's talk earlier, if you guys were in there, um, centralized logging is huge for this. So uh, I always point out that you can use Elasticsearch and Kibana, and those two things will come together. And if you want to learn more about Elasticsearch and Kibana, you can actually look at my 2014 talk. I was standing right over about here-ish. Um, it's on YouTube, and it's actually a pretty good talk about how we use log aggregation, and we take all of our, our logs from all our different nodes, put it in one server, and it, that's really great, because if somebody comes in and goes, hey, I'm having a problem with a node, and you say, well, what node are you on? And then they hopefully can tell you, or maybe not, and then you have to what? You have to VPN in, then you SSH into the box, then you go to the server, then you tail the logs, and you go find them, or you just go to Kibana, and you say, show me all the logs from this server. And it'll just poof, list them all out for you, which is great. So what's missing from that picture? Um, there was no web server. I'll go back to it in a second. There was no web server, so no Apache, no Nginx, no CDN, right? So no Akamai, no, no um, cloud for it, no nothing like that. Um, multicast, as I discussed earlier, so no multicast J groups discovery. And uh, an NFS server, there was no centralized storage point. And as you know, in LifeRay, when you do a cluster, there's a couple things you have to take into account. You have to take into account the centralized storage, and you can't use a SAN. You have to use an NFS version 4 or better file system, or S3. And LifeRay does come with, from I think 6.0 up, has an S3 hook. So you can actually just put an S3 connector right into LifeRay. It'll store everything in your buckets for you. And that's really nice because S3 has 11 nines of availability. So your data is pretty much never going to get lost. It's always going to be there. And we have had, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we don't use S3 because we're on Helion. And we do use uh, bare metal NFS boxes that run it. And we've had those go down before. And it's a mess, an absolute mess when it goes down. So. That was what's missing. What's super awesome about that last picture? Auto-scaling Elasticsearch. So you guys know in DXP, Elasticsearch is the default, right? And you know that LifeRay ships with Elasticsearch. So all you have to do is spin a node up, and Elasticsearch is there and available. You also know that if you're running DXP, which is the licensed version of LifeRay, we don't support running that Elasticsearch in production. Did you know that? No. Because it's not really well talked about. You can't run an embedded Elasticsearch in a production level environment. It's a terrible idea. You'll never survive. It's just the load is too much on the search servers. So you need to spin up a second Elasticsearch box, like a dedicated Elasticsearch box for everything to search against and index against. Do you want to manage that? Probably not, right? You're developers. You don't really want to spin up and learn Elasticsearch. So you can actually use um, Elastic Cloud on Amazon, and they'll do it all for you. You just point your nodes to Amazon's Elasticsearch box, and it'll spin up and down based on the load you're sending automatically. You just pay for the data you send. Really, really cool. Um, auto scaling, auto backup, and load balance databases is an amazing thing. And you can su they support MS SQL, Postgres. MariaDB, MySQL, all the good things, Oracle. Um, and being able to not have to worry about your database is amazing. And 
you, you guys have ever had a problem where you know, your life race server is being slow, or maybe it's gone down, and somebody says, hey, I think it's the database, right? Maybe the database is down. So then you what? You go call a DBA, and they maybe, if you have a DBA, or they call you and you have to wake up, and then you go and you look at the logs and the graphs and you try to figure out what's going on. With RDS, A, I've never had a failure on it, and I've been working on it for three years, um, never once. Automatic backups, five minute snapshots, so you can go back to five minutes. At any point, you can go backwards within five minutes. And uh, using CloudWatch, which I'll talk about later, you can do full monitoring. You have a nice dashboard set up on your homepage that tells you the status of all your, your servers, number of connections, how many users are there, how much data is flowing, what the CPU looks like, all that stuff, automatic. Um, Amazon just introduced Amazon Elastic File System. So if you don't want to use S3, it is a full NFS v4 mount that you can actually use. You spin it up and it puts a mount right in your Linux boxes, your Windows boxes, and that's for shared file systems. So in your, cl in your cluster, you can either point to S3 for file storage or you can point to your um, NFS server that is now being hosted by Amazon. You can do either one and it's okay. The one thing that I like about using S3, though, is that you can put your links to be public. And one of the problems with LifeRay is when you go to download a file, Tomcat actually takes that file and then restreams it. So you're using Tomcat connections to send files up, and it's A, slow, and B, you're using up a finite number of threads that you have in your app server. With this, you can actually say when you click on a document library link, if it's a guest viewable link, instead, just get it right from S3. And, and S3, if you ever download directly from S3, all that stuff is propagated across all regions in all availability zones. So you can be in Tokyo downloading a file that somebody put in Los Angeles or Oklahoma, and it'll be just as fast as if you're downloading it from Oklahoma. It's amazing, and it offloads all that work. So that's really great. Um, and the other awesome thing about it is cloud formation. I know we have one person here because we were talking about it yesterday using cloud formation. So what's cloud formation? Cloud formation is basically a big, huge JSON document where you describe your infrastructure, right? And it's, it's, it's software infrastructure. You take that JSON document, you upload it to Amazon, and Amazon goes and creates an exact duplicate of whatever you have. So you can say, I have my production environment completely set up. Make me a cloud formation template. Then you have that template, and you can put it in GitHub, right? So now you're doing code revisioning you're, you're versioning your infrastructure, right? So you can say, okay, well, we need to roll back to four nodes. Well, here's a different cloud formation template for that. Okay, now we're gonna go back to six nodes. Well, there's a different cloud formation template for that. And the cloud formation template is more than just scripted hardware. It's all the software on the boxes too. If you know a little bit of Chef, then you can use something called OpsWorks with CloudFormation, and you can spin up all your boxes. It will get Java, get LifeRay, start all your services, lock down all your ports, install Apache if you want it, set up Elasticsearch all in one shot. So what's really cool about that is we had a, a production issue at Hewlett Packard Enterprise during the North American Symposium. And... Um, it was pretty awful. Somebody had installed some code that uh, basically imported 1.7 million categories, asset categories, on accident. It wasn't supposed to do that. And they've customized our permission algorithm to read categories based on user tags. So what, what ended up happening is, if you know anything about LifeRay's permissioning system, you know every object that runs through LifeRay gets permissioned. So five people would try to log in, and our memory would fill up. And keep in mind, we have 18 gig heaps on all of our JVMs, and it would totally crash us out. And we'd try to reproduce it in staging in lower environments, but that script was only ever run in production. And this is actually really great, because we were, we were switching from JBoss to Tomcat over that weekend, so everybody freaks out thinking it's the Tomcat switch, when really it's this old code that existed that nobody even knew about. And to be able to say, give me a snapshot of production as it is right now, and make a dev environment for me, and it takes about... 10 minutes for CloudFormation to run and spin all this up, um, and then be able to debug from there so I'm not hitting production the whole time would have been amazing. So being able to do this for your developers is a huge, huge deal, right? Because now each developer can have their own full stack, which is really nice. So what parts of AWS should you use? 
Um, well, you pretty much have to use VPCs. It's a virtual private cloud. It's basically your own little data center inside Amazon. So you have to do that. Um, EC2 is what Amazon calls their machines, their EC2 machines. Um, RDS for database, I can't stress this enough. There's no reason to run your own database unless you need system level access for something. Like if you need root on a box that your database is running on for whatever reason, then you can't use RDS. But for any other reason, use it, use it. I mean, multi-AZ propagation is awesome. So in Amazon, there's regions, right? And regions are basically by continent mostly. And inside those regions are multiple availability zones. So I can say I want to use US East 1, which is in Virginia, and US West 2, which is in Oregon. So I'm going to spin up my boxes in these two areas. And when I spin up the database, it also spins up databases in all those areas, which is great because Florida can get wiped out by a tornado or a hurricane or something like that. And all my stuff stays up because half of it's in Oregon. And that's OK. And what's also really cool is if you use auto scaling and elastic load balancing, what happens is the hurricane comes through and wipes Virginia off the map. And all your nodes there go down. And auto scaling goes, he had four nodes a minute ago. He's told me that he likes running on four nodes and is willing to go up to six if something goes wrong. I'm going to go ahead and just spin up two extra nodes. And it'll create machines for you on the fly, spin them up, start life rate, and they're added to the cluster instantly. It's really cool. And, that's, and then you wake up after the fact to the alarms going off, and you're like, oh, well, it already repaired itself. So I'm good. We didn't need Virginia anyway. It was cool. Uh, and then obviously S3 for your document storage for various reasons. Um, file size is up to five terabytes that you can store there, and they still guarantee um, 11 nines of uptime. Really great. Really cool stuff. So what's really cool to use? That's what you should use. What can you use? And this is where this stuff gets really, really interesting, right? Because before, in the what should you use, you can reproduce most of that in bare metal, right? Not the load balancing, not, not like the auto scaling. You can't magically like, make a, a load balance or a, a physical machine. But everything else you can do without. Um, but where do you want to go? So. OpsWorks is amazing. Being able to script the installs of everything using Chef is really cool. You don't have to do this. You can do it via multiple ways. The only reason that I recommend Chef is because if you're going to be using Amazon, you should just go in with all, all in with their tools, right? Let them work for you. And Chef's the default one for OpsWorks. It's the only one that works. So you should really try it out. It does amazing things automatically. CloudFormation, which we already talked about. Um, I would use GitHub. So, Amazon has something called Code Commit, which is the Amazon code repository. It's not great. Um, they only host it in Virginia, so you've only got the one area to work with. It's just not awesome. Use GitHub. GitHub's great for that. Um, SES. How many of you guys send emails from your production servers? Anybody? Does anybody send any type of bulk emails? I'm bulk being more than 50 a day. Not one. OK. So um, when you do that, are you using SMTP to do it? Yeah. Yes. OK. And it's slow, right? And it sucks. So you want to use SES. Or if you don't want to use SES, even if you're not on Amazon, use Mailgun, right? Mailgun's awesome. Uh, there's a full API for that. And I rewrote for, um, for HP. We rewrote because they send out about mm, 50,000 emails a day. So it was taking literally an entire day to send out all 50,000 emails. And at one point, we couldn't even get them all out in one day. It was so slow because of SMTP. Using Mailgun or Amazon SES, I can blast out 50,000 emails in about a minute. It's incredible. It's r fully restful. It's async. So you just say, you send this off, and you just let me know when you get it back. And what's really cool is that you can then say, tag these messages with one pixel transparent GIFs. And it'll actually tell you, not only did the person, did the email send properly, the person received the email, and the person has opened the email. And if you want, you can actually have it also tag your links with a redirector. So not only has the person received your email and opened your email and read your email, but they clicked on these two links in your email. That's amazing. And to be able to send it so fast, it's really cool. So I would recommend using that for sure. IAM is Amazon's roles and provisioning system. So if you're going to be serious about Amazon, you definitely need to get into using their roles because you don't necessarily want your developers to be able to spin up like uh, 
are two extra large machines, right? You're going to run like $10,000 a month. So you say, you're allowed to access S3, and you're allowed to spin up machines, and never the twain shall meet. It works really great. Another thing for S3 is um, versioning. So we had an incident at a company that I won't name um, internally where somebody accidentally dumped our data folder for an internal life ray. And um, they read a script in such a way that it recursed through our backups as well and dumped all of them. So we lost an entire site's worth of data in about a second. And it was just gone straight up. So what's really cool about S3 is that you can set permissioning based on deletes and you can enable versioning. So we actually changed our infrastructure internally to use S3. We enabled versioning. We created an IAM role for LifeRay and said, this LifeRay user can do anything that they want except remove delete tags. It's the only thing they can't do. So LifeRay can actually go in and delete it and it will version it as deleted but LifeRay can never go in and then delete that version. That would have to be another user. So it's now absolutely impossible to lose data from LifeRay. And we have all our versioning built in uh, S3 as well, plus obviously the redundant backups uh, of versioning from LifeRay. So no risk of data loss, pretty much. No risk. Um, Elasticsearch is a service, which, as I said earlier, is amazing, being able to run your own Elasticsearch cluster by just pushing a button. And that's it. And Amazon goes, how much traffic am I getting? Do we have enough bandwidth? Yeah, okay. Yep. Too, much, too much bandwidth now? Okay, take it back down. It's amazing. Um, workspaces. If you were at the unconference yesterday, we had a little bit of talk about how to spin up developers quickly. And I mentioned using Vagrant, and I mentioned using Amazon Workspaces. If we have time, I'm going to show you guys a little demo of what Amazon Workspaces looks like. Basically, what they did is they took Windows 2008 Data Center Edition, they installed the Windows 7 look and feel over the top of it, and then they provision users for that. And they give you guys, uh, you can do, I think, up to four CPUs, up to eight gigs of RAM in a Windows 7 environment. And then you can log in and you have your own Windows 7 environment that you can run from a tablet, you can run it from an Android or iPhone, you can run it from Linux, OS X, Windows, whatever, right? Which is great because if my laptop falls and breaks right now, I can just grab my tablet and keep working like nothing ever happened as long as you're using the workspace. It's also great because I can take a snapshot of my workspace because Johnny just started working with us and I want him to spin him up quickly. So I snapshot my workspace, I recreate a workspace for Johnny and now Johnny has my exact setup ready to go. So he has all my code, all my tools, all my everything, great for spinning people up and creating new developers. So you're in the cloud, and one of the things that's scary about the cloud is you can never go, oh no, it's wrong, and unplug it, and then plug it back in, right? There's no like, way to physically get to a keyboard and feel that warmth of the CPU around you, and it's a little scary. It's cold. It's a little bit uh, detached. So how do you monitor this stuff to make sure that it actually works? And Nathan Shaw did talk about this a little bit last time, um, but these are the big ones. So CloudWatch is Amazon, and you don't actually have to have servers hosted on Amazon to use CloudWatch. One of the cool things about Amazon is if you can do it through the UI, you can do it through their SDK. That's the rule. That's the mantra of Amazon. Jeff Bezos made that very clear the day AWS was made. Our APIs are public. We only use public APIs. Internally, we do not use anything but a public API. It got so bad that Jeff Bezos said, if I ever see a team using an API that is not published to the public, you're fired. Straight up. So they're very good about, if Amazon can do it, we can do it. So anything that you see in an Amazon console, you can do through an SDK, through scripting, right? Um, so CloudWatch is cool. You can send all your metrics up to CloudWatch, JMX statistics, memory statistics, disk full statistics, whatever statistics you want, and it'll store them all, graph them all for you, map them all for you. It's really great. Um, and then Dynatrace, I love. I was a big New Relic fan back in 2014 for various reasons. I still like New Relic because it's cheap, but Dynatrace does more, and we'll get into some of the differences here. Uh, and then AppDynamics is a lot like Dynatrace, but also expensive. So for CloudWatch, what does that offer you? CloudWatch will give you machine-level statistics from Amazon, so um, block storage devices, network in-out, CPU, um, no RAM. It won't do RAM. And no JVM data, you can, you can add it through APIs if you want. Um, but you can auto-scale from it. So you can set triggers up in CloudWatch to say, if my CPU goes up too high, spin up two more boxes for me. And then when it goes down too low, drop them back down. But don't flap. So take 10 minutes to do it, right? So it gives a chance to calm down. 
And that's what CloudWatch kind of looks like. So this is a CPU graph of one machine that I've got here, my time cards machine. Uh, it's got a specific instance. It's really cool too. You can actually, if you're in a cluster, you can select multiple instances and it'll overlay all the CPU graphs on top of each other. So you can see if one node's going nuts and the other one's not and kind of figure out why, which is really cool. You can also set it up so if one node goes insane and starts doing massive CPU, you can just drop that machine and recreate a new machine, which is also really neat. Um, now the big three. So Dynatrace, AppDynamics, and New Relic. Um, HPE, when I first rolled on, had nothing. No monitoring at all. And now they have um, New Relic. Well, they had it up until last week. So we dumped New Relic and we went to Dynatrace. Why did we do that? I don't have a whole lot of time, but I think this is very important if you're going to go to the cloud that you can really monitor this stuff. Uh, and even if you're not, honestly, you still need to be able to monitor. So New Relic is really cool. It'll tell you threads. It'll tell you what pages people are going to. It'll tell you CPU usage. It'll tell you JVM data. But it won't send you alerts based on JVM data. That's one of the real shortcomings of New Relic. So I can see that my garbage collection is high. I can see my average is high. But I can't ever get an email alert saying, I'm in GC hell. I don't know what to do anymore. Um, Dynatrace does let you do that. Dynatrace also lets you take memory snapshots within Dynatrace. And you can actually permission that out so regular developers can't actually push the button. You need somebody else to do that because you don't want people taking memory dumps of a production database just for the fun of it because it's crushing. Um, you can also do CPU profiling that actually works. New Relics is a little wonky. And you can do uh, CPU thread dumps right away. So that's huge for debugging and production, being able to say, what are my threads doing? This is something that Dynatrace and AppDynamics can do. New Relic can't. Now, New Relic's about a quarter of the price. So it really depends on kind of how you want to do it. This is an idea of what Dynatrace looks like. Dynatrace is, LifeRay is a partner with Dynatrace. So we actually have fast packs available that you plug in. And Dynatrace will not only tell you your basic statistics, but it'll also tell you on a poor portlet basis. So it'll say portlet A has this average time, portlet B has this average time. So you can actually look at it right away and say what pages are slow and what portlets are on that page and what portlets are making that page slow. And, you, know, you can do some really cool stuff with Dynatrace that you can't do with AppDynamics or New Relic. So um, tips and suggestions, like I said, use IAM to limit uh, LifeRay's access to your document repository so you can't ever experience what we experienced where we lost all our data. Um, centralizing your logging is huge. And it doesn't matter. You can use Logly or Splunk or you can use Elasticsearch with Kibana if you want to. And you look up my talk from 2014 for that. I get into real detail. I give you the actual code to do it and everything. Um, but you want to do it for sure because it's so useful to be able to go into Elasticsearch. And if you want, you can tag users. So for HP, what we do is we tag a user with a specific token right when they log in. And then I store that token as a cookie. And then I have Apache as part of the Apache logs, log that specific cookie. And then I put those logs up into Elasticsearch. So I can say, Brett logged in at this time and then hit these pages. Each page took this amount of time to render. He then clicked all these buttons and then he logged out. His entire session length was this. So when business comes in and they say, you know, this person says they can't access their page, I can follow back and see exactly the steps that they took. So I don't have to go like, well, how'd they get there? What were they doing? I can go look at the logs, put that user's token in, and I'll see every visit that user has ever done to our web page across all nodes, right? So what happens if you don't have sticky sessions, right? If you're doing session replication, you have to go through all your logs for all your nodes to figure out what's going on. With this, it doesn't matter. They're all in one place. It's really awesome. And you can also do things like searching for warnings and lots of other things. Uh, it'd be really awesome. And for uh, Amazon, you want to use Bastion servers or jump boxes to access your in instances, which keeps everything just nice and safe and segregated. And this is kind of how you feel after you're all done. You're like, it's so amazing. It's so great when all your stuff spins up and it's, it's just a lot of fun. Um, so I've got one minute. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys uh, workspaces. So I'm on the LifeRay Wi-Fi, which isn't super duper amazing. Um, but What's key is even on our, our subpar internet, I'm pretty sure that this will work. And if not, I, I'm just going to go run and cry. <laughs> so this will support multiple monitors. It supports local printers, local scanners, basically everything that's on your machine. And I just booted up a Windows X, a 7 environment. 
That's it. We're done. I just turned it on. It was off before. Amazon said, oh, you want to connect? Okay, hang on. Turn it on. Wait a second. Okay, now you're in. This is billable hourly. So, and it's only billable as you're using it. The second you log off, the timer stops. It's $35 a month for 100% usage. So it'll only max out at $35 a month per developer. And these machines are no slackers. And if you're running your servers inside Amazon and your workspace is in the same physical data center as your servers, the SSH connection from this machine to that machine and file copy and everything is blazingly fast. Like, I can do downloads that sustain 100 megabits on this, no problem, all day long. It's spectacular. And being able to take that snapshot and give it to your developers so you guys are all in the same group, it's just amazing. So if you're going to use it, I say give it a try. They'll let you give, I think they'll do two months for free. So you can kind of experiment with it and, and they'll let you do it for free, which is great. So good. Anybody have any questions? Hey! <laughs> that was your question. Oh, you don't see. It's been up, All I swear. Right. It didn't just come up. Uh, <laughs> it was on my screen. But yeah, so it, uh, it works really great. And um, using Amazon Workspaces also gives you free access to Amazon Files. So it's a shared file system. kind of like OneDrive or Dropbox. So you can easily share your local content with everybody in the company. You get 100 gigs for free when you spin up a workspace. Um, so that's just nice. It's just a nice add-on. Yeah. All right, yep. Yeah. Hold on. So everyone can hear you. Uh, what you told before with the S3 bucket to serve the content directly, is it included in the connector, or is it some code that you've written yourself? We, we custom wrote that, um, but if you want to use it, you can always rate my session and email me, and I'll get it to you. But you have to rate the session, and it has to be at least four stars. <laughs> Easy. Any more questions? Yeah, up there. Notice, by the way, I installed Dynatrace on this, so I can connect my Dynatrace machine directly to my Amazon machines, and the connection is just amazing as well. Yeah, it's great. Uh, hi. Um, in terms of uh, using Elasticsearch, I, I heard um, uh, JVM for Elasticsearch and then also Rifle should be same. So uh, using um, like Elasticsearch for uh, AWS, is it okay to use it? or? Um, actually, uh, you, uh, I just set up the, my own uh, Elastic search, uh, search clusters because uh, um, I'm using a certain version of the JVM for Rifle. So, uh, is it okay to use uh, Elastic Search service for uh, yeah. Rifle DXP? Yeah, you can uh, use the Elastic Search service, that's fine. You can use your own Elastic Search cluster. The only thing you can't do is run the embedded Elastic Search that comes with Rifle in production. We won't support it. Like okay. It works, but it's a terrible idea. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Right, yep. yep. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you for, for the presentation. I have a question about the choice for the monitoring tools. Yes. You, uh, you named uh, Dynatrace across or above uh, AppDynamics. Are you able to name such, uh, the core features which made you uh, decide upon a Dynatrace uh, for that? Yeah, the fast packs. For me, the fast packs are the reason I choose it. I've used AppDynamics before. It's really great. But having the plugins for Dynatrace that automatically are hooked into LifeRay because we developed it is awesome, basically. It makes it so you don't really have to understand LifeRay to be able to performance tune and diagnose problems in LifeRay. That's really the biggest thing for me. Um, I also really like the architecture, and I know it's kind of buzzwordy and stuff like that, but you'll hear AppDynamics say, we sample, and you'll hear Dynatrace say, well, we don't sample. You're getting 100% of the results. And AppDynamics says, and New Relic is the same. They sample as well. And you'll hear them say, well, you don't really have to get 100% of the results. It's not necessary. And I just like the warm, co cozy blanket of I have 100% of my requests all the time. I think that's really awesome. Uh, what I will say about Dynatrace is they're client sucks. It's basically Eclipse that they kind of hack together and put other stuff in. They do have a web client now. Um, but that would be the two things. So 100% transaction tracing and the fast packs that give you life ray visibility immediately with no work, for me, is, is big. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. But if you're using AppDynamics, there's no problem with that. 
the, the goal here is you've never used anything, install all three. They'll all three give you one or two month trials for free and figure out what works for you. It's just, I've used in production New Relic and I've used Dynatrace. I've never used AppDynamics in production, so I can't say anything toward it. Okay, we have time for one more question. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding the, the provider of cloud services. Uh, you were talking about Amazon. Uh, do you have also experiences with other um, cloud providers and, well, uh, with LifeRay together? So we've Thank used, you. we've launched LifeRay on AWS, Rackspace, HPE, Helion, uh, Azure, and that's it. That's what, that's what I've done them on. So um, they all work. Uh, it's not that I necessarily pick one over the other, other than the fact that I like Amazon because I am certified, I understand the product, I understand the platform, it just works for me. I like all their tooling. Azure's pretty nice. So if you're a Windows shop and you want to run in the cloud, Azure's not a, bad, not a bad call. Rackspace, you can do it in Rackspace Cloud, and they actually support level two networking, so you can do multicast, which has positives. But I just feel like Amazon's tooling is a little bit more mature. And Gartner would agree. I mean, they're always top right quad quadrant every time, although Azure's coming up pretty quick. Um, so yeah, it's just, you can do it in pretty much any of them. I have most experience in AWS, then Azure, then Rackspace. Okay, if you guys have any more questions, um, this is my last talk for the whole day, so just grab me and we'll chat, no big deal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brett.